Good evening everyone, this is Free Russia Forum channel, our special stream. My name is Dmitry Semyonov. Though my role today is minimal, I will present the topic of the discussion and introduce our participants to you and let them sail free with it. Today we'll talk about impact of Russo-Ukrainian war on global history. And today we have Gary Kasparov, politician and co-founder of Free Russia Forum. Good evening. Good evening. And Alexei Aristovich, advisor to the head of the administration of the president of Ukraine. And a small introduction from me. Impact of Russo-Ukrainian war on global history. And here we have several scenarios and even apocalyptic one, which may bring us to the end of the global history. And I would like you to talk about this. And I would like to give the floor to Gary Kasparov first. Today I was watching news from the front, and of course, when you receive such alarming reports, you instinctively want to talk about what's going on now. But I think that we need to leave these talks to others, and we need to try to focus on things, say, eternal, something that will be a true outcome of this war. But in order to look into the future, first it, uh, it makes sense to uh, look at the past. I have a very strong feeling, and I spoke about it and wrote about it, that the war was imminent, this tragedy. Humanity approaches certain turning points, let it be World War I or World War II or some other tragic events. And now this is Russo-Ukrainian war, the last phase of this war, because the war started eight years ago, and Putin's war with the civilized world started even before that. So how does it feel? I understand that now we are pressured with all this news from the front, uh, good and, and not so good uh, ones, and they're dominating people's mind. But nevertheless, if we talk about historical imminence of this war. Well, the war was imminent, and if even we kind of stay with uh, pure facts, this is what we see. 1991, the collapse of the Soviet Union. The problem started back then when they were trying to divide the Black Sea fleet and strategic weapons. And as a result of that was with the past memorandum. Uh, the liberal Russia existed from 1991 to 1993. In 1993, they shot at the parliament. In 1993, uh, they started uh, the so-called which is uh, President Mishkov who was uh, giving out Russian passports and arming pensioners, and they were even uh, mining the ships of the Black Sea fleet. There were some skirmishes. Then, then the tempering of elections result uh, in 1996. Uh, then uh, gas wars. Then Tuzla Island conflict of 2003 in Kerch Strait and uh, <coughs> they almost got to armed clash, uh, then continuation of gas wars, then uh, Maidan uprising in 2004-2005, relationship with Russia were worsening, then Putin's Munich speech, this is when he shaped his political face, and uh, we know what were those explosions on Kashirsky Highway in Moscow, uh, uh, the second war in Chechnya was extremely cruel, even in the Kremlin, and they admitted it, whereas uh, the Chechens, uh, they thought they were fighting for independence. Then the Munich speech of Putin, uh, then the Russo-Georgian war in 2008. Putin's regime finally chose trading on fear as its foreign and domestic policy tool, and it was clear that the only rival that uh, Russia had, which didn't want to be in this relationship of legal lord and feudatory, that was Ukraine. And how can you actually be a strong power if you can't deal with your feudatory? 
how can you threaten uh, the Swedes if Ukraine is bothering you so much? So therefore, uh, it was inevitable that they'll try to suppress us in Ukraine. They just needed to find a reason for that. Uh, after the second Maidan, uh, they started annexing Crimea. They started doing this when Yanukovych was still the president of Ukraine. And uh, Yanukovych was trying to make agreements with the Euro European Commission, uh, he was preparing elections, uh, then eight years of war, and now we have the active phase of this war. And if you even look at this framework that I just described, the war was imminent. And as Putin propaganda says, they are fighting against America-centric world. They want to destroy the world where America is dominating. And they want to revamp it and make it a multipolar system uh, where uh, different countries have different influence areas in the format of Yalta Potsdam conference. And they think that this fight is fair. And on top of that, they have metaphysical uh, substantiation, the so-called catahon. Uh, in other words, the one who withholds uh, th this white angel that stands against the evil and uh, the Kremlin is that Katahan is that white angel. Then we recall what Putin was saying about the invasion on the 23rd of February. He spent an hour for that. Uh, and he kind of blurted out uh, his military and political uh, concept. And he actually looks at the war metaphysically. And uh, he thinks that this war uh, goes all the way back to the baptism of Russia 1,000 years ago, and uh, Russia, the, in its silver armor, stands against crusaders of the West. So all those archetypes, and he seriously works, uh, seriously believes in this metahistoric framework. And I actually also think that now we are fighting over uh, the legacy of Kiev Rus, and we have a similar conflict uh, to, uh, con to the conflict of uh, Arabs and uh, Israelis who are, that are fighting uh, over the Temple Mount. I have this project of a rebuilding. Uh, 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 Russia and Ukraine in the 18th century, in the beginning of the 18th century, when the uh, Moscovian Rus took over Kievan Rus, stole, stole the ruling. And then uh, this idea was shaped as a continuous legacy of Kievan Rus. Russia is the only modern state that has its historical center outside of its borders in Kiev. And this is what they used to substantiate the war. And from this point of view, this war was even more imminent uh, than uh, the reason the, uh, that you may think about as a destruction of America centric world. Many pieces that you describe, I agree with them, uh, but they could be arranged a bit differently. Well, I can tell you how they can be arranged. But in any case, it explains to us why from 1991 to 2013 Moscow didn't make any diplomatic demarche. And I think the uniqueness of annexation of, of Crimea and uh, Moscow aggression against Ukraine doesn't have any historic example. Because there was no any territorial claims. Hitler and Saddam Hussein, they always had some pseudo-historic claims for certain territory. From 1991 to 2013, Yeltsin, Putin, then Medvedev and Putin again, and all Russian parliaments, they ratified a whole number of agreements with Ukraine. And you're right, uh, when you recalled President Meshkov in Crimea, uh, who thought that uh, Crimea belonged to uh, Russia. But, before, but uh, over all this period, they, were not, they had never any claims 
for Crimea. But there is another point here. Because they work within the framework of Helsinki Agreement of 1975, the territorial integrity uh, of the after-war borders. They cannot deny this agreement. Uh, this is uh, the foundation of security system in Europe. But they found a way. They decided that Ukraine is a fascist state uh, that ha have chemical uh, and bio -labor laboratories, bioweapon laboratories, and uh, threatening Russia. And Russia need to curtail this threat. And as they say, Russia never attacks. Russia defends itself, and Russia is trying to defend itself. Itself, uh, from uh, uh, evil Ukraine that has military budget uh, one twelfth of the Russian one. I would say this uh, this is a poorly arranged story, and actually it shows us uh, that the system of security in Europe uh, doesn't work anymore because it cannot pre prevent anything. And actually, when we're talking about uh, grounds of this invasion, uh, we need to remember that when Kosovo story started and when the West got involved, the grounds for that was genocide and Kosovo independent state appeared because of the genocide that was committed by Milosevic government. And I remember that Russia was trying to actively counteract it, but yet had to put up with it. And I think Putin took it into account. If it's a genocide, then you can attack. That's why all this nonsense about the Jews and fascists in Ukraine and all that, there was this genocide in Donbass. They started using uh, this slogan. They they tried to kind of copy what was uh, two decades ago when uh, Western countries, they use genocide as justification for Kosovo independence. Now they'll try to do the same here. Doesn't matter if it was true or not, but the main thing was to use the word. It sounds kind of good. Then it gives us a reason to attack Ukraine. Well, they're kind of following Lenin's path. Lenin was an infernal personality, and unlike Stalin, he was almost a genius man. And he came up with a perfect theory of how to corrupt the West. He has uh, uh, these words, let's buy the rope from capitalists and then would hand them on it. He lived in Switzerland, he lived in the UK, and he uh, observed how the West is working. He kind of knew the system from within. Russian intelligence, Soviet intelligence ha had no problem to find weaknesses in the West, and the West uh, actually did it even better than those intelligence, because you just need to open the newspaper of that time and kind of read all the weaknesses yourself, and you know that. I was trying to explain to my colleagues in the West how that works, uh, those uh, Western representatives of security services, uh, they asked me this question, how could you explain that Putin's regime funds ultra-left and ultra-right organizations in Europe because it's politically illogical. And I said to them, so you're thinking wrong. Lenin came up with it. Just imagine a chunk of ice. In this chunk of ice you can see uh, cracks. And you can actually uh, see those cracks because you lit them very well. And then you hit them with a chisel and you crack the chunk of ice. So what's the idea? So any weaknesses of yours uh, will be used against you, and it can be environmental problem, energy problem, uh, informational problem, national problem, can be immediately turned into a political one. So and immediately they uh, raise a, a question of uh, political representation and many other things. This is Lenin's path. Uh, he developed it, uh, th he, they pass it on from, uh, from security services one to another, and uh, uh, there is another feature. Remember the uh, Soviet counterintelligence operation trust of 1920s. Uh, it's, uh, the CHK, the Bolshevik police, they came up with this idea of uh, creating a fake organization 
that was pro-monarch organization, the underground one in Soviet Union, and they persuaded the West that there is this powerful uh, monarchy, underground movement, and they persuaded the West to fund this organization, and they managed to g get some Russian dissidents from the West and arrest them here. So how special services work? They work as a using uh, po police provocation as a tool. The, the thing is that you need to become the best friend of the one who we, whom you want to kill. And I was born to a special service officer family. And when I was a child in 1982, I remember those uh, talks at the table that Uringoy Pamara Ushgerot pipeline and that whole story with the oil crisis in the West that was so urgent back then, this whole thing was laid out as a corruption scheme. It wasn't only the cash flow from the West to Russia, but they used this money to buy people in the West, to buy pol politicians in the West. And in Europe, they don't quite understand that some of the political parties, they are still funded uh, by Soviet money. Money, a fourth generation of them and when they're defending uh, left-centric ideas and this system they don't quite understand it they kind of say is it true that Kremlin the Kremlin can work uh, play like that let's look at the secret of the Cambridge five 1930 1950s all of them were aristocrats Kim Philby was a senior officer in Britain's secret intelligence service and how does it work like that, that, you know, all those uh, peasants from villages can recruit English aristocracy, or Aldrich Ames, uh, that was recruited uh, by KGB? How does it work? As uh, my uh, KGB friend used to tell me, uh, he used to say, you have ideas, whereas we have methods. And sometimes when you actually work face to face with a person, those methods are more effective, uh, unless this person uh, knows what's going on, knows that he was worked on, and they don't get in that trap. The West is disunited, the West is split. And it's not really by Putin, but the West is splitting itself. The thing is that in the West, they formulate the idea like this, we are not ready for the world, where Russia lost or Putin regime lost. But here it's a very important point, I always point this out, the word Russia that um, they use, it's a wrong way to use it, because Putin will lose, that's very important, no, it's wrong, Russia will win if Putin regimes fails. <laughs> Yes, exactly. This is what I'm saying. <laughs> they are substituting Russia with Putin, and uh, this is wrong. But actually, if they don't uh, differentiate these two, uh, they don't see the strategy of the future. They kind of sit in those warm baths, and they don't really understand what's going on. Well, actually, they don't have strategy of the future. Of course, they don't. They don't have an image of the future. They have some fantasies of the world, uh, where there is no oil, will fly somewhere in space, and all that. And the definition of sacrifice is gone from political vocabulary of the West. But let me go back to the imminence of the war. There were so many arguments. Uh, was it possible to avoid World War One or World War Two? Yet uh, many people think that, as minimum, the world has been living in the paradigm of World War One, and it gave us this ripple effect. Maybe something that's happening today is the consequences of World War One. The world changed and hasn't found the point of balance yet. So how about this concept of the through history, this history of 110 years, we're still trying to find a point of balance after the world collapsed in 1914, because before that it seemed that the world was pretty stable and pretty favorable for people, and uh, the lifestyle was getting better everywhere, in Russia, in America, in Europe, everywhere, people were getting better. 
And quality of life was growing better for many people. And all of a sudden, this event happens, World War One, and it's still echoing in our life as a tragedy. But uh, remember the time uh, before 1914, you can easily get on train in a small town in Russia without passport, without any custom restrictions, uh, and you can... Uh, in a few days you can be in Europe, uh, free movement of people and goods across the border. But what after that? After the war, passports, customs, bureaucracy. Then bureaucracy came replacing aristocracy, aristocrats that died on the battlefield of this war. And another important thing happened, and what you know and maybe our audience also knows that, that in the West, World War I is more important than World War II, because this is when the rational model of the West collapsed. And the tragedy was that 1913, when everybody believed in rationality. It was obvious in everything, uh, from manufacturing of, uh, of chocolate to manufacturing a dirigible. <laughs> Technological progress was absolutely astounding, and the pace was amazing. People who were born in 1861 and a match uh, was a miracle, especially if you're somewhere from the boonies. But in 1915, you're already listening to the theory of relativity. You know, they have cinematography, there are automobiles, uh, there are planes, uh, the penicillin was invented. By the way, not so many people understand that. We think that we live in the age of technological progress, but if we look in, at it in absolute terms, we can say that uh, the period of time from 1870 to 1910, it was a golden age of technology. Don't forget they invented telephone, uh, vinyl discs, cinematography, telephone. And all of a sudden something happens as First World War and enlightened Europeans, they kill killing each other, they get into dirty, uh, into dirty trenches and they poison each other with gas. And this is the best of the best of aristocracy. And many scientists died in the battlefields. Uh, I saw a graduation list of officers, uh, 324 names in that list and only three came back from the war. Uh, this is what killed so many people. So many people were millions were killed, people were poisoned with gas. What was important uh, that this irrationality looked in the eye of the West. And the result of that was fascism. When foundation was destroyed, on these ruins we had communism and fascism. These two, these two poisonous mushrooms were the extreme forms of reaction to the crisis of rationality in the West. What Ortega y Gasset uh, wrote in his work, The Revolt of the Masses, there were no deterrents anymore. For hundreds of years, uh, they were generating these deterrents, and now arist aristocrats are gone and are replaced with bourgeois. And the, we have this tectonic shift, and as a result of this, Bolshevism in Russia, the civil war, then fascism, and across the world. And today, we we'll live in this paradigm. World War II becomes the second round of World War I, and sometimes they look at it as the same war, the same uh, goals, and the same coalitions. And after that, we have two winners, the United States and the Soviet Union. But I don't think that uh, the uh, Soviet Union was uh, the winner, and Stalin didn't think that either. Uh, he wasn't celebrating uh, V days. After 1945, the horrible thing happened because what they did, they made politics a carnival stage. It became a show. First, aristocrats fell and they were replaced with the bourgeois, and then it was replaced with carnival. And carnival, this is an event where uh, people exchange their masks, they exchange their social roles. 
and it went on like that. But real processes remained. Politics, this is geography, strategy is geography, the same issues of different straits, of different islands, and so on and so forth. But if we look at the battles in Ukraine, they're happening in the same historical places as they were happening uh, hundreds of years ago. Uh, attack on Kiev, attack on Mariupol. And we also can refer to the ancient archetypes here. And then there is a question. What is fighting what or who is fighting who? We can say, as Biden said, that uh, digital democracies are fighting against obscurantists. Or we can look at it as uh, Aristovich uh, looks at it, that uh, old Rus is fighting the distorted idea of uh, Russia that is uh, growing as a tumor on Russia and we need to bring Russia back on track. And it's not only Ukraine, but also Belarus and uh, good people in Russia. They may look at it the same. Then another thing, that is so-called aftermath wars, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, that uh, they want to uh, fight what we have today in Ukraine is uh, on the other side of Iron Curtain, or it's a uh, restoration of the Soviet Union, or it's a war against uh, the America-centric world, or it's a war to figure out uh, the arrangement of, of the US, China, and uh, a Russia triangle. I think it's all together, but there is another important part here. I think it's a war for a new civilization, and we shouldn't be looking at it any other way. It shouldn't be taken less. And I'll tell you why I think that. Because the old civilization is done. It ended in 1991, the one that uh, existed from World War One, And then for 30 years it was inertia movement. Uh, it was illusion of the end of the history. So they kind of have nothing to worry about in the West. So it's the end of history. And I think that Mm. The philosopher Fukuyama was right when he was saying that, so it's the end of history, when he said. He kind of said that, you know, that was the end of the old history, and now we need to begin a new history, but it turns out that the West is not ready to begin new history, they still live in an old paradigm, and for some of the Westerners, especially old Europe, they don't want to become uh, history makers. They want to keep the old history at any cost. They simply cannot, they are unable uh, to be history makers. I think that just realization of their historic responsibility, I think it just crushes people, uh, these politicians in the West. It's not for them. They're not a proper caliber for that. And I think that the, uh, this chunk of this historic determination, uh, with they look at it and it's just it just scares them. Uh, they're working uh, on the idea that Europe should be just a museum where you can eat a croissant and drink coffee. To start a new history, it's not about them, but history put them on the spot and what are you going to do? They don't want even look at the situation, but the situation is pretty clear, so they may be blamed that we are going to, but let's go from, but the old world is impossible. If the old system did not prevent the uh, biggest continental war in Europe, that can easily turn into a nuclear war, and you and you're saying that it may end humanity. So the old the old world is impossible, and the same thing happened after World War One when the old world was not possible anymore. So conflict in Ukraine may not grow into a, a large war uh, that will cover Africa and all other countries, but even within Ukrainian. Uh, Borders. The old world is impossible. When we look at the proposal,
officials of the French, uh, the Italians and the Germans, uh, they say so it should be Minsk three agreements and Ukraine should sacrifice part of its territory. But it's not that we are heard about it, you know, the, because the territory that Ukraine may give up to Putin, uh, Putin will use as a platform to start a new attack. Frankly, it's an attempt not to make peace. This is an attempt to buy side some time for themselves. It's kind of, you know, I want to stay uh, in power during my term and what's happened next, I don't care. And they don't understand the scale of, of the challenge. And what happens today, it's similar to what was happening 100 years ago. Back then, people were giants, but still couldn't figure out uh, what was going on. And again, what's important it, it is to clearly assess what's going on, that there is no old history anymore and a new history begins, so now we need to fight for new history, for a new civilization, and that's the only program we have to have. And since the world after the war will be better, so we need to understand why better and what's, what does it mean better. Okay, Alexei, I agree uh, with such presentation of the problem, so we should do it like this. We're talking about the components of the old world and some elements of the old history that will be part of the future, because uh, history does not start from a clean slate. We need to see how all this brick will be put together, like in a Lego. So let's not talk about World War I, uh, but thousand years back, because Putin seems to be thinking the same way, but the whole, he has a pretty uh, chaotic mix uh, in his head. Uh, but what about this discourse, uh, well, European uh, Rus against uh, the uh, Golden uh, Horde? Uh, because uh, Moscovian Rus became uh, the successor uh, of the Golden uh, Horde, and everything that they had in Rus uh, and in the northwest uh, of uh, uh, Russia, uh, Pskov City Republic uh, and uh, Novgorod City uh, Republic. Uh, so all uh, that was devoured uh, by the Golden uh, Horde legacy uh, and ideologically uh, becomes uh, this ever expanding empire that Quartico doesn't attack anyone. But we need to understand that uh, the Golden Horde proposal is not as primitive as people may think in the West, uh, those who support Putin. What Genghis Khan said, is a law, I made this law so that a virgin with a tray of jewelry could walk from Bukhara city to the far east, being untouched, in other words, long distance without losing jewelry and without losing her virginity. This idea of order, the world is chaos and the power that will offer order and stability will win. This is what they keep offering from World War II, uh, from World War I. Before World War I, it was spirit of enterprise, both European and American civilization. They had people uh, who were aiming at the sky, aiming at space. They were expanding frontiers of knowledge. But what happened, the characteristics of civilization were gone, so the main motive was replaced. We were experimenting we were people who were following Columbus's and Magellan's. And now we are people whose main demand is stability and security. So it was very easy to sell it to people, first scare them and then to sell security. Pandemic, quite a good example. I don't argue that pandemic existed, but the whole arrangement around it, how they were selling security, that was a refrain of the whole thing. And Putin is saying, why they actually listen to Putin in the West? Because he is saying that despite the fact, you know, they're actually blaming him, accusing him, and we need to end Putin's regime. And Biden said that Putin has, be, has to be gone. But Putin and his uh, uh, Golden Horde uh, proposal is that they're going to offer order. This is the main argument that the occupational uh, forces use. They say Kiev 
authority. This is chaos, and we bring order. This is the key argument that they offer to people, offer to locals. So, and uh, the uh, order proposal will only be successful while we have chaos in the world. And they are selling this order, uh, uh, and that's why they listen to them. And over the last 70 years in Europe, this is the main demand. So we're not Columbus's and Magellan's anymore. We're just bourgeois who are reading uh, expensive books with a good coffee and croissant. But we don't want to travel as Magellans. But and the question is here, so what we can offer this new civilization opposing Genghis Khan's proposal? We will offer a new order, a new chaos, or a mix of chaos and order. Do we have uh, such an answer? Civilizational poverty of the West is that they have nothing to propose to the people opposing Genghis Khan. Khan, because the order they had is discredited, is compromised, and also, you know, Putin propaganda may use that. They say, as soon as you bring your order, I mean, democracy immediately turns into World War One, into Holocaust, turns into endless European revolutions. Just look at Ukraine, it was a good country till 1991, but now they're under your influence and have LGDP rallies and all that kind of thing, and the chaos. So, and the Maidans and all that, anything but Maidan. Remember that story in Kemerovo city in Siberia, uh, when uh, there was this man whose family died in the fire, but then he said, so whatever happens, so let it be whatever, even my family may die, but no Maidan uprising in Russia. And they say Maidan is chaos. We say it's freedom, they say it's chaos. And then for them, freedom is chaos. And they say, we bring you order, and so that the virgin can go from Lisbon to Vladivostok to the Far East, and uh, nobody will touch him. We'll bring order, so on. and uh, Putin say, and she won't be touched. She can drive this Russian car from Lisbon uh, to Far East. And there is another thing that's very important. There is a cult of personality. As you precisely said, if Putin says this order is personified, there should be a Genghis Khan. It's easier for people, because a pack has to have a leader, and other forms of uh, self-organization, they're not properly perceived by collective consciousness. They're still kind of in the paradigm of uh, Neanderthal man. You know how I trained my uh, uh, young lieutenants when I was a senior officer? I told them, if you need to uh, agree with somebody on something, this is how they actually recruited uh, the Cambridge Five. I said to them, you need to listen to the guy very carefully. You have to be very active in listening, and you have to be very serious in what he is saying. And you need to demonstrate respect to the man. And then my lieutenant says to me, but how is it possible, you know, he's not going to listen, to, he's not going to talk to me because he, has, uh, he knows eight languages, no, he is aristocrat, he's Englishman. But no, because biology works here. This is uh, that's why Martin Heidegger, you know, this great philosopher, was so impressed by Hitler's hands, and he was saying that this guy will bring order. But in other words, if you are truly interested in the person, and if you're always on the same side with this person, and you're trying to kind of tackle uh, the problems that this person has, and the secret is very simple: you do it twice, three times, and you you get the idea. You kind of even paraphrasing paraphrasing the guy. And and it doesn't matter how egg-headed this person is, you know, how much they know, people get into this trap very easily, unless they know what's going on uh, and they know the mechanism. But I have to tell you, with uh, collective consciousness, it's even easier. Do you remember how Putin was rising? They were saying, it's a young man, unlike drunkard Yeltsin, he will bring order. Click, and there are explosions in Chechnya, it was chaos in Russia, they understood uh, that, you know, the man who is, uh, who doesn't know what he's doing, he's not going to bring things together, I mean Yeltsin, and now here is the man, there is young man who will bring order, you know, even killing people on their toilets. So, yeah, we can sell, we can take away their freedoms and sell them order. And all ideological poverty of the West is that they don't know what to offer anything. The greatness of Ukraine is it's not like, you know, we are a great country, great nation. No, it's not that. 
том, что мы нашли цивилизационное предложение. We found the civilizational proposal, as I think, a new one, and we didn't do it on purpose, so we didn't really have time for that. But what happened, it kind of grew within us when we faced the matter of survival for our nations, the word will or freedom. This is something that you can use to achieve something, and will and freedom together. It sounds like this. This is the right and ability to realize your beautiful heartfelt intention. It's like Elon Musk, I want to fly to Mars, and I say, follow me. I don't use force, I don't sell information, don't sell fear or anything else. Uh, I, I'm just saying, go with me, follow me, it's more interesting. This is feature of Ukraine. We clearly realize that what we are fighting for, we are fighting for this will and freedom, and this, this civilization proposal, it's very important. Doesn't matter actually if it's Ukrainian or not, it's, it's going to be good for anybody, for Europe, for Russia, for any other country. So this is for the people who can realize beautiful heartfelt intentions they have. And then uh, Strugatsky's uh, book, Afternoon World, I, uh, I have uh, the stream where I analyze their books, these uh, sci-fi books, and I say, what is civilization of afternoon world? Uh, this is uh, moving from the world of fear to the world of curiosity. In such a way, we become Columbuses and Magellans on a new loop of this spiral. And it's possible to play this game, but there are some regimes that they have uh, an extreme resources from nuclear weapons and uh, natural resources, they have been burden uh, for humanity and they stop humanity from developing. So we need to end those regimes because they don't let humanity develop. They give us kind of a dark alternative and this is a false order, but real order is built not on uh, imposed discipline, it's, uh, it's built on free movements of soul. In Ukraine, I'll give you an example, uh, they distributed 150,000 uh, uh, assault rifles because we need to uh, protect ourselves from the invasion. And we know now by fact that nobody was killing anybody in Ukraine. There were machine guns and people were not using them against each other. Why? Because we have a completely different motivation. We have enough of our own problems that people can deal using uh, arms. But the thing is that I am a free citizen and I'm given the weapon. I'm not going to use this weapon against other free citizens. We can be dissatisfied with each with one another, but the right to act freely is more important uh, than a free parking spot. And I think that this is an important proposal that we have. This is what we bring to the world and we say, let's build a new civilization, civilization of will and freedom. It's what important is will as, as freedom, as expression of freedom. It's a new form of self-organization. And for Ukrainians, it's very pleasant because that uh, dovetails with the Zaporozhian siege, the protestate of Cossacks. They used to say, if you want to share this lifestyle with us, then come, do it. So I was, when I was uh, drawing a picture of my project of how it's going to be in the future, I was saying that this civilization of these free cities, of techno-parks, uh, future, future cities, uh, it's like Edinburgh is a, a theater capital, uh, Dnipro is a space capital, that humanitarian capital, Minsk and uh, St. Petersburg, this is civilization, and all these cities, they're connected uh, by high-speed transportation, people do whatever they want in those cities, for example, I want to do chess, I want to do science, they immediately give you everything you need, they give you a folder where everything is spelled out, where you need to go, where is your kindergarten for your, for your kids and all that. I actually saw that in technological university in Denmark, 20 people came to me and they said, you know, these three people where they will be uh, doing video recording of your work here is two professors that will be your supervisors when you're going to be doing your scientific work here is the person who will be doing uh, publicity for you so you are provided with everything just you know create do your thing this is the affiliation I am uh, dreaming of and when people come to Ukraine you know say from Vladivostok from Thailand whatever so I want to come here and I want to build this and I think that this is should be the result of the war and to everybody let's Let's try to live this way. Why should we be afraid? Why to use cookie cutter just to ensure that a virgin could walk untouched from one city to another? 
the main lie in Genghis Khan that this Isalo works only at a whim of him. So, but if you know he will uh, want to rape this virgin tomorrow, so nothing will stop him. So, in other words, this order exists only at the whim of a particular leader. Then my question is, I agree that Ukrainian war, I, say, I would say victory of Ukraine in this war, but I have to tell you we are far from it. It's going to be very difficult. If the war ends differently, then the world will go back to this Ivan the Terrible time and Stalin. And by the way, uh, Putin uses uh, these two rulers or rulers like them to feed his idea. So if we're talking about these rulers, they're Russian rulers, they're those who were above the law. They were the law. Kind of do as I say. But if we suppose that on a subconscious level a prospect of new contours of new civilization appearing and historic defeat of the Golden Horde and it will leave uh, the political stage. Well, China is kind of looming there somewhere. I think that this prospect scares those managers who are uh, running the free world. In some way, Macron's and Draghi behavior, if we look, if we look at France and Italy, it's not a matter of corruption or... Because actually I want to uh, check all European politicians on corruption. It's, I think Putin has either corrupted them or has some discrediting evidence on them. I think uh, on the subconscious level they think that victory of Ukraine will end the world where they, as a subspecies of such managers, they prosper, and a different world will begin, the, the world of Elon Musk, the world of free people, where there is no place for these political impotents uh, who are acting as parasite, parasites on different fears of people. Say, there are pragmatic reasons, corruption and discrediting evidence, and also, on subconscious level, uh, there is like an ideological rejection of this new world that will come after Ukrainian victory. I think this is a motivational base, and I think, yes, it is very deep in subconsciousness, and they have this Futura shock, as uh, philosopher Tothor said. We spoke about it, you know, and not only Kremlin is not interested in Maidan, and the, the West is not interested in that either. If we talk about will and freedom as developing the idea of Maidan, because this actually cancels the civilization of calm, civilization of... Uh, uh, selling freedom for soup. So, back then, you know, we were expecting in, in, we were expecting new things, uh, new mathematics, uh, new theories like Einstein and all that. And now, these figures as uh, modern European uh, politicians, in this crisis we can see how insignificant they are. They're not going to withstand that, as you properly said. It's either corruption, financial corruption, or metaphysical corruption. It will evolution. It will cancel them as a species. They can maybe can't rationalize it like this, but they do feel it the same way that Russian pseudo elites consolidating around Putin feel that too, and they support Putin because they understand that uh, if Putin is gone, they're gone too. And I think here we, we're going to have a quite a serious fight, and Russia is fighting on the battlefield with Putin regime, and on the level of meta-history, it is fighting the old world that is personified by the people who are making decisions in modern Europe and somewhere else in the world.
Uh, and I think that this is both complexity and the greatness of the fight we fight. And this is how we need to stay this problem. No any other motive will help us to win the war, because any other motive won't be motivated enough. Because the whole discussion about the independence of Ukraine that can end uh, with the discussion on influence of uh, Washington and European loans and how uh, weak Ukrainian state is. And so what then? So should we follow just any orders of these historical dwarfs that are afraid of being uh, destroyed by the history? So what are we going to do? Are we going to save these 50, 70 years for humanity or are we going to lose the 50, 70 years uh, of human for humanity? So if we're going to lose this year, Years. from the point of view of history it's it's an instant but from the point of view of our life and our uh, uh, children and grandchildren so we don't want to leave Russia to Putin and I don't want to leave Ukraine and, and Russia to Putin so what's important here we need to precisely define what's going on and precisely define what we're fighting for because the old civilization is gone nobody can argue that so it's very important what we're doing here the question of what Ukraine is fighting for is not always getting the right answer, proper answer. It's not only a matter of survival of the state and returning all the occupied territories. And it's not only a matter of uh, uh, keeping the structure of security in Europe. And it's not only a matter of uh, keeping the global system of security in the world and uh, territorial integrity principle. I, I think it's it's a certain shift to a new state, to a new quality state. You can say it, uh, they were fighting against tyranny, but I think it's even uh, higher than that, another level on top of it. I think we're going away from stagnation, and this stagnation, we live in it, over the last 30 years, after this uh, cold war, after the end of it, uh, the free world fell into stagnation. And now I'm working on the book that's called The World of Fake Values. I, I want to raise all these matters. And uh, somehow the cold war was sort of keeping the West together. That's why there were Reagan's, Thatcher's, and of course President Truman kind of started the whole structure that uh, helped to win the cold war. But the Cold War was over and the West went into complacency. And uh, we can see how American presidents were replacing one another and we could see how uh, the whole thing was descending. Three presidents were were purely domestic presidents. They were not perceived as leaders of the free world. America kind of lost its messianic role. That's why Obama, he kind of says, so we leave all countries, we apologize to everybody, and then Trump, we are doing business no matter what, and Biden, obviously, his agenda was extremely left. He was talking about the global climate, crisis, guaranteeing equal results, not opportunities for everyone. The results should be the same for everyone. So all this woke ideal ideology. And right now, I see that in the States, uh, those things began to fail, uh, because Ukraine sort of revealed the whole thing. It's because all of them are fake values. Ukrainian war kind of opened those boils that were growing for many years. That's why the outcome of the war is supposed to create a new language, a, a new metahistoric language that will help us to deal with all these things. That's why I think there is such a, a strong resistance to the change, a fear that Ukraine will win, that Putin will be defeated. 
that this uh, imperial matrix will be defeated, uh, that many, many people think that this is an inherent part of the so-called state code. But let's not, not, let's not talk about current events, because the news are not so great, but I, I do believe uh, that the march of history is uh, going, and despite sabotage of the old uh, Europe and uh, the uh, slow movements of American bureaucracy, Ukraine will get the weapons and will win. So what is the image of the victory? How, let's put it this way, is it, would it be possible to build something new because uh, the eastern Ukraine is destroyed and south southern Ukraine is destroyed but what about would it be possible to uh, build uh, the city of the sun as Campanella said and first of all it will demonstrate what is possible for those people abroad I mean in uh, Russia because Russia will follow Ukraine is it possible to create this ideological reserve that will help to spread and emit this energy everywhere. I think that uh, liberation of Russia begins only when the Ukrainian flag will be raised in Sevastopol in Crimea. This is the order of events. So say uh, Sevastopol is freed. Uh, Ukraine restore this control over this territory. We can actually demonstrate it, Gary. I would uh, change the metahistorical language. I would say that uh, Russia will not follow Ukraine. Russia will follow a will and freedom. Russia had it. Cossacks, Novgorod City Republic and all other free republics and all those experiments uh, such as the Green Ukraine in the Far East. In Russia, there is an extremely strong pattern of freedom, and, but uh, these dark forces worked in such a way they were stomping on, 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 on all of it. And I think uh, those dark forces were doing it because there was so much light in, uh, in Russia. And if we say that Russia is incapable of anything, so it's wrong because this is this we're discrediting uh, all those graves, all those people who are fighting for Novgorod Republic and many others other free cities in Russia. Talking about Donbass and the south of Ukraine, it's very simple here. We already invited some of the best architects that will help us to restore Ukraine and we say to them, so on the ruins, build whatever you want, you're absolutely free, you can realize any free intentions you have and architecture is a great thing, it's like, you know, it's like Wi-Fi that we need to share with others. In Kherson, the occupational forces, they wanted to uh, restore Lenin, monuments to Lenin, but you know, there is a very interesting observation. It's almost like an anecdote, uh, where they had uh, uh, Lenin monuments, uh, this is where uh, uh, the border uh, remained between uh, the occupational forces and Ukrainians. But I'm, you know, I'm very pro-architecture. I think that architecture creates environment and monuments create environment. This is what I want to say. They used to say that in Greece there are more statues uh, than people, but uh, the Greeks, they thought that they need statues so that the people can look at them and get inspired, so you can look at philosopher or an athlete statue and you could be inspired by that. So, And when we begin to build new world, we can say to everyone, come here and work with us, and everybody will understand that it's possible to do that. When I was 25, I have this idea and I wrote in my diary. I decided to write uh, my objectives, and the first thing was to destroy disciplinary society. And it's important to understand that modernism could uh, go not along the mod uh, disciplinary path, but it went along the disciplinary path. And why? Because they wanted to create so-called disciplinary citizens. 
десятки миллионов кровавых жертв и утвердила этот план развития, продолжения. So, and this is very important to understand uh, in both discipline and self-discipline. And Putin's regime, that is a fascist regime, is going to bring me order, and this is the order of the whim of the leader. And the system works for the whim of the leader. So, and what we oppose them with, this is freedom of individual and self-discipline of an individual. You can protect your position. You can express yourself freely. And this is a feast. And, you know, the main metaphor of the New Testament, this is a feast. We bring everybody to the feast, to the feast of free expression of will and freedom. We say two very important things. First of all, you can win in this unequal fight. Remember, they gave us only 72 hours, but we won. All of us, all together, all free people, free people in Russia, free people in China, in America, everywhere, all over the world. And secondly, after the victory, we won't fall into complacency. We won't be falling into resentment. We will be building new things. It's possible not to be poisoned with freedom, uh, with uh, victory. And uh, as they say, you know, the key characteristics of hell is that all hope abandon you who enter here. And Ivan Efremov, uh, Russian writer, sci-fi writer, uh, he used to say, so there should be exit strategy from a dead end, from, uh, from this black hole. It's very important to show people this uh, way out, and Ukraine shows this way out. It's, uh, there is a way out uh, from any uh, threat to your survival. You can uh, find the way out in the victory and not get poisoned with the victory. So we show that there can be different examples of behavior, because, you know, humanity, it's like a little child, you know, the first thing you see you think is your mother, so what's important to show uh, uh, to this uh, little child best examples. So I'm trying to uh, fight with uh, Ukrainian propaganda, so you shouldn't be humiliating the Russian prisoners, and also I always say that we are on the side of light, we need to share our Wi-Fi, when people can see that we are different, that we do different, we're like metaphysical Wi-Fi, we're offering a different way of existence, a different modus operandi, we're saying follow me, and it's not because we're senior or like better or anything else, no, God forbid, there shouldn't be anything like that, it should be like with Jesus Christ, follow me, his civilizational proposal was he wasn't explaining advantages of Christianity, he was not propaga propagating Christianity, he was just saying, I live differently, follow me, not even follow me, go with me. So this is the proposal, so if you want to come to us, if you want to help us to rebuild, destroy Kherson or Donetsk or Mariupol, please come, create, do whatever you want. So we give you everything you need. So now we're at a different level of conversation. We've been uh, on air for more than an hour. So, but if we talk, uh, you know, about such historical Freudism, you know, when, when you recall different iterations of uh, Russia, Pskov Republic, uh, Novgorod uh, Free City Republic, and now uh, in Russian diaspora they have these spontaneous rallies against the war, and they came up with a new flag, it's actually a new old flag, when they removed uh, the red stripe on the flag, in other words, they are saying that it shouldn't be color of blood on the Russian flag. And what's interesting that uh, blue and 
white uh, colors on the flag. These are colors of uh, Novgorod Republic. And somehow, you know, the history kind of finished that loop like that, you know, kind of completed it. So, and I think that the, this is the right direction they're moving to. Just a couple of more phrases here. And also very important uh, thing, and we can maybe continue that. And Russia as a shadow of the West in this Freudian uh, sense. Because Russia and the West they were always uh, in a very complex relationship. And three times Russia sacrificed itself to modernization of the West. This is Peter the Great, Peter Stalin, uh, this is Putin. Stalin, and now Putin. He wants to do that. And secondly, where to actually find resources, where to find strengths. This is uh, Far East, the Urals, Rostov on Don, and the Russian North. And I think it's very underestimated. Do you remember that movie, uh, Russia Primordial? They showed uh, Peter's paradigm, Peter the Great paradigm, but they showed what was there on the north, in Arkhalgensk, those seamen, those travelers. It was kind of echoes of Novgorod City Republic. And they showed this old, ancient archetypes, uh, the people of uh, the northern uh, sagas, northern stories and Tolkien stories. Uh, these are brave people, they're free people. Yes, if we rely on such archetypes, yes, of course. Uh, and we, you know, in other, other conversations, we may talk about new forms of finances, uh, the, all those bitcoins, and other ways of uh, fighting uh, against the domination of the world world. In fact, the components of new world, uh, they show up. But for them to be solid, of course, we need Ukraine to win. It's important to set the trend because digitalization gives us opportunities, but on the other hand, it gives us a trap that turns into digital fascism, like in China. So that's why it's very important to talk about it. But you know, computer can be used either way. I always say that computer cannot be good or bad. Machine, a machine is just a reflection of a human. That's why we, humanity, as people, uh, we have a monopoly on evil. We shouldn't think about uh, Terminator or other robot killers. We need to think about who gets hands on this new technology and what ideology, human ideology, it will serve. So it's a great reason to have another talk or even a series of talks. I already see actually the whole agenda of our following talks, but let's wait for good news from the front and I do hope that it'll come, maybe two, three weeks, whatever it takes, when we get this good news, so that we have a bigger positive charge, so to speak, to talk about this beautiful future that we have, and to hear you to inspire people all over the world, not only in Ukraine, because yes, we see how the image of the future is shaping. I'm not saying bright future, but I'm saying that future that everybody will want to live. Yes, we are fighting over it right now, and even uh, uh, Freud, being completely focused on person's past, used to say that a person is determined by the future more than by uh, the past. And an image of the future can pull one out from the most hopeless past, and this is where humanity got lost. It lost an image of an attractive future where people want to be. It has done mostly with the present to the best, and it is quite wrong. So with this, let's finish our stream. Dmitry, so we'll have a break. And this is the first conversation in the series of conversations about the role of Ukraine and the victory of Ukraine in the war and how it will influence human history.